I had never heard a Boston accent before until I, you know, got drafted here. We had a security guard named Lynchy. He's been, I think he's been with the Celtics for the last 30 years. And he probably was my favorite person in the organization. Just, you know, one, because of his accent, but two, because he was just, he, he represented like a, a Bostonian to me. Like, you know, just angry all the time, but a great guy, but angry all the time. Always pissed about something. Ah, oh, get out of here, man. What the is this? Uh, I just come up to him and mess with his shirt or something. Get, get out of here, get out of here. He was about 70, 80 years old. Yeah, that was my first experience with like a Boston accent. So anytime somebody asks me, I always do my lynchy impression because that's, that was one of the, the first people that I met in Boston and he had an impact on me. Yeah. My hands are like lotion, lotion on my hand. <laughs> my introduction, you want to know my real introduction? You, you, you want to hear it? Yeah. I, my introduction to Boston, like I, when I first got drafted, they booed me. Like they, I remember Wick calling my name, like, and I remember he having to defend, like, why? He's up there not saying, like, we drafted Jalen, he's going to be one of the best players the city has ever seen. He's up there like defending the pick. Like we're sticking with it. Y'all like get over it. Like this is who we're going with. And all the fans were booing. Da, 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 da. I remember that was my first memory of Boston. Uh, I didn't care, uh, to be honest, you know. Like before I got drafted, I, I honestly I told God to put me where he needed me. And he chose me to be here for whatever reason. Uh, I remember distinctly, I didn't care where I went. You know, I could have played basketball in Alaska. Like, it didn't matter to me. Uh, but I told him to put me where I needed to be. And he placed me in Boston. So instantly I knew that it was, it was bigger than, you know, my personal decisions and my personal, you know, happiness. It's about what you can do, you know, how you can affect the community and how you're going to use your platform. Because I really feel like that's the only reason why I got talent. It's because, you know, our creator wanted me to do something, you know, with it. Yeah. Bigger than just, you know, what I do on the court. One of the most important things that need to be addressed is the city. All of it. Yeah. All of it. You know, I've lived it here in Boston and there's like misconceptions in Boston. Like there's a lot of Bostonians who have lived here, who are great people who are into the community, who have uh, devoted their life to, you know, to some of the issues that you just talked about, incarceration, wealth disparity, our education system. It's a lot of families that have been here for a long time in Boston that, you know, represent excellence. And you wouldn't hear that or see that based upon the narrative that they have in Boston. But then there's also the, the part of Boston where the shoe fits. And I've seen that side where subliminally there's a lot of issues that go on in our society that, that gets covered up. Like the, the wealth disparity, you know, rankings every year, Boston is top five. For the last 20 years, Boston has been top five. The wealth disparity meaning, you know, people of color make significantly less than you look at like the incarceration rate. I think it's like 26% of the city is people of color. 98% of the arrests are people of color, right? And you start to look at these statistics, and it's hard to say that Boston is not living up to the hype. And people like to argue, like, no, it's not. I haven't experienced anything. But if you look at the stats, you look at the, the wealth disparity, you look at the incarceration rate, you look at what's going on, how many, the education system, you look at, you know, the amount of resources being allotted to, um, Boston Public Schools, BPS, versus with a lot of resources that's going maybe to Wellesley or going to these other parts in the city. Um, there's issues here, glaring ones, that you know they might not be direct or overt to you, like to your face or confrontational. But there's issues in this city that need to be addressed 
you know, and everybody, because they're not to your face, everybody thinks everything's fine. Yeah. But in reality, it's not, and it's not equal opportunity. And there's art, there's art inequalities that are being taken place right now. And somebody gotta say something. That's one thing, it's like, being a leader, you gotta not just talk the talk, you gotta like walk the walk. Like you gotta be the example and stuff like that. And that's not just in basketball, that's just in life. Whether you're an older brother, whether you're a father, um, a son, a daughter, a mother, like being an example is a great form of leadership because, you know, people don't do, as, do what you say, they do as, they do as you do, you know, right? So being able to be that prime example for them, um, especially in the position that I'm in about how I'm into my community, how I use my platform, how I represent myself as an athlete, how I carry myself, how to be kind, how to be disciplined. You know, these are things that I always try to push out for the world to see, because I hope that more and more of our youth will be able to, to gravitate to things like that. Because a lot of stuff that they see is not the reality. This is what people are trying to push for. So if it's gonna be me, you know, what I'm gonna push for for my platform is you're gonna see me in the community because I want you to do the same. You're gonna see me, you know, giving back because I want you to do the same. You're gonna see me being kind to people for the most part because I want you to do the same. Because those are things I think like not only can affect you, they can affect your community and they can affect, you know, kind of like the planet at the same time.